Ready? I'm ready when you are, Manny. Good evening, everyone. So, my name is Manny Brown, and I am a senior here at John Carroll, majoring in uh, gender sexuality and women's studies with minor in psychology. I have the pleasure of interning um, in the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion as one of the programming interns. Um, one of my main responsibilities is curating the social justice movie series, as well as the last lecture series, which brings you here today. So, tonight we're featuring our very uh, lovely president, Dr. Dawson, who will be sharing um, his last lecture. Don't worry, it's not his last lecture. But <laughs> in honor of the series, it's his last lecture. Um, so I hope you all enjoy the stories that we will be sharing. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'll get them to the Thank you, Manny. Uh, I have a visual aid here that I will explain in a moment as well, but up in the corner here, if you want to come look at it later, it's actually a picture of me with my grandma and grandma. I'm literally about three or four years old. But that's sort of what this kind of lecture gets you to think about. Uh, but first I want to say how proud uh, I am, and my wife and I are, Manny, our first year at, at John Carroll's been fun to watch you. I, I can't figure out whether it's you or John Tucci or, or uh, Shoop, you know, how they take on so many things uh, while they're here and do them well. So thank you, you know, for having me here today. Um, so I picked a theme for this talk. Again, it's a kind of morbid, but it works. Last lecture, right? I'm 63. I hope I don't get my last lecture for at least 30 more years. Uh, but it gets you to think about things. And I think that's the purpose. Um, and I started thinking about one of the, the, I think, more interesting books. If you haven't read it, you should read it. There was a, a Detroit Free Press sports writer, Image Alamo, who became a bestseller. Uh, his first book was Tuesdays with Maury, about his sociology professor, Maury Schwartz, who uh, died at ALS, um, and the time he spent with him. But then he wrote one called The Five People You Meet in Heaven. So the title of mine is The Five People Michael Would Meet in Heaven, uh, with apologies to Mitch Elbow. Um, again, the theme here is, imagine your last day on Earth, and what would your last lecture be? Um, now, it even caused me, this topic even caused me to think about what I would wear today. Because, uh, you know, there's this kind of this expectation that the president should wear a suit. I would never wear a suit when I lecture. Yeah, it's lucky I got a tie on. Uh, when I was a professor, I would say, you know, I just had a button down and slack, so here I am. Um, <clears throat> but in this book, The Five People You Meet in Heaven, in Mitch Elbum's book, it's about a maintenance man named Eddie who has this unfortunate accident, is sent to heaven, and he meets five, these five people who had this significant impact uh, on his life, kind of inflection points uh, in his life. So I thought that would be a fun theme, uh, hoping, of course, again, as Manny said, this doesn't happen for a long, long time. Well, why about the people? Because one of the things I've really come to believe, especially as I've gotten you know, a little older, at least, um, is that relationships are the most important thing Right. No one, I've told my students for years, that no one goes to meet their maker wishing they put more money in the bank or publish another article or another book. They go thinking about the people they've loved, who've loved them, you know, who've had impact on them, who they've impacted you know, along the way. So it's all about people. So this was a chance also to talk about people. Uh, the other one of the themes here is to learn a little bit about me outside of um, my job here, or my job as a dean or a provost before that, but going back a little bit farther. So obviously this doesn't include a lot of people that are very dear to me. It leaves my wife out, it leaves my kids out, it leaves my brothers and sister out, you know, a lot of colleagues I've talked about, I've had a chance to talk about a lot of colleagues in a number of different uh, environments when I've talked about inspired leadership, so I'm not talking about them at all. This is more about people from a different period of my life which in particular the college students here, uh, the students here, uh, hopefully appreciate the two of them are my professors that I had when I was younger, who have passed away. Now, so it's a chance to look into to people who you might not normally include you know, on the list. Um, so I picked five people as well, just as, just as Mitch Elvin did in his book. Uh, the first one is Oscar Johnson, who's my grandfather. Uh, this is Oscar right here. Um, and again, that's me when I'm saying I'm probably about four years old. Um, my mother, Muriel Beth Wasserberger, uh, 
Uh, my grandfather passed away in about 1970, uh, well into his 80s. I'll talk a little bit more about him. My mother uh, passed away. She was the daughter. My, my grandfather was a Swedish immigrant, so I'm going to tell a little bit about his story, which I think is an interesting story in today's world. Uh, my mother was the daughter of two German immigrants uh, in Wisconsin um, and uh, died when I was a first year graduate student. Uh, my father was a surgical oncologist. He's the third one. He died when I was a fourth year graduate student. So both my parents died when I was in graduate school. Um, then I had two professors, uh, Professor Einhorn, uh, Hillel Einhorn. Uh, we called him Hilly. Uh, Hilly was one of my professors at the University of Chicago um, who had Hodgkin's disease both before and after you know, I had uh, time with him in Chicago. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about him. And then I call the next one, I don't call him John, I call him Professor Culbertson, uh, because Professor John Culbertson was my economics professor at the University of Wisconsin as an, under, as an undergraduate. And he passed away at the age of 81, about 15 years ago. Um, so these are the five people I'm going to talk about. Again, the purpose is to think about individuals who will tell you something about me that goes beyond what you know. Um, so this group hopefully will be able to do that. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about each one of them. Uh, so I'll talk about meeting on, I'll talk about meeting each one of these people, then I'll talk about what they would say to me about my life when they meet me in heaven. Right. So meeting Oscar. Oscar was a classic American immigrant story. He, he was one of six brothers uh, in a small town in South Central Sweden who was not going to inherit anything from his parents. So the three younger brothers all decided to emigrate to the United States. What's interesting is they came here thinking they would make some money and go back home. That America was a land of opportunity. They could come and uh, they, they wouldn't necessarily settle there. Uh, he came to the United States in 1908 on a very famous ship called the Lusitania. So Lusitania was the same ship that was sunk in 1915 by a German U-boat. Um, so he came here on steerage class. Uh, there's a great book out there called Dead Wake by Eric Larson that spent a lot of time on the New York Times bestseller list, uh, nonfiction. And it uh, is all about the last voyage of the Lusitania. Um, there's a sister ship called the Mauritania. So he came over here, and you think about his journey. He went from South Central Sweden, a little town called Bilstad. He went to Malmo, uh, from Malmo to Manchester, England by boat, by train, to Liverpool, on the Lusitania to New York, right? From New York by train to Chicago, eventually he ends up in Black River Falls, Wisconsin, uh, as a logger, uh, where two of his brothers were there. One of them died of scarlet fever. Uh, again, so you think about courage and taking different paths. You know, what immigrants to this country have done for so long um, is pretty darn remarkable. He settled in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, uh, where my father was, was born, and my dad was the only son to, to Oscar and Yenny. That's Yenny. Normally you would say Jenny or Jennifer, but Grandpa kept his thick Swedish accent uh, through his whole life, so Grandma's name was Yenny. Um, this was a picture that hung, come on in. This was a picture that hung in my grandfather's bedroom when I was a little boy. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this visit. Um, my grandpa was perfectly healthy, um, 84 years old when my grandmother passed away. She had a stroke and died. Um, and I swear my grandfather died of a broken heart because he was perfectly healthy. He literally told my father I'm going to live 18 months and he lived 18 months. No, so it was one of those stories. They were happily married for over 50 years. Uh, my grandmother, I remember, used to make me Swedish pancakes in the morning. I'd go visit them, right? Because my dad would be sleeping in, my grandpa would be sleeping in. But my grandpa was this just genuinely warm, kind person. He's one of those people that when you were a little kid, you just immediately warmed up to, right? So I love my, my grandpa. He would take me down into the basement and show me his mementos, because uh, he used to be in the Swedish Army. And he would, you know, they always said, well, this is where the concept of a fika came up earlier, you know what a fika is. So how do you not love a guy who had a fika every morning? A fika is a, is a Swedish 
tradition of having coffee and cookies or cake every morning. But it's not a pika unless you do it in a social environment. So you always do it with people. It's an opportunity to go socialize and build relationships. So I did a sabbatical in Sweden in 1998 in the Voyage of Young. And I was on a floor with about 25 other faculty members at the University of Karlstad. And every morning at 10 o'clock, there was a little bell out in the hallway. And every morning, someone was responsible for the coffee, and someone was responsible for the cookies. And at 10 o'clock, the bell would ring, which means the coffee was ready, and everyone would come out of their office and socialize. In fact, I was reading an article, I was looking up FICA, and I was reading an article that the workers at the Volvo plant uh, still have a FICA every morning, even if it impacts productivity, because it's very important to the culture. Um, so my grandfather was this very, very warm, uh, warm guy. Um, I felt, I think when my grandfather passed away, it was my first profound sense of loss that you feel when, when, a, when a family member passes away. Um, and so when he died, there was one picture that I always loved as a little boy, and it was this picture. And now this is, now what's funny about this picture, this is a lithograph from the Hercules Powder Company. This is 102 years old. This lithograph. This is from World War I. Um, and it was clearly probably used to raise bond money, you know, for the war effort. So the Americans were just getting into the war. Um, and I don't own a gun. I've never owned a gun. So it's not about guns. I actually don't own a dog either because I'm allergic to dogs. <laughs> but it's about the relationship between the dog and the young man. And so the dog sees the young man with his rifle and his uniform going off to war, and the young man says, not this trip, old pal. Now this is like any, this could be any New England town or Ohio town, you know, in the middle of fall, because if you look at it, there's leaves falling and so forth. And I just love this. This, every time I look at this picture, I think of my grandfather, right? Because that was the one thing I wanted, you know, after he and grandmother passed away. So upon meeting grandpa again, what would he say to me? Um, I think he would tell me how proud my own mother and father were of my academic accomplishments. Because again, he did not go to the University of the United States. My mother and father were first generation college students. And they died relatively young. You know, so he would say, you know, you, you, your mom and dad would be very proud of you. I think he would say that there was a time I remember overhearing him tell my father that he thought I was going to grow up to be a preacher. So he literally thought as a little boy I was going to grow up to be, at that point in time, a Lutheran preacher, right? And I think what he would say is you have to live a life of service. You know, committing yourself, when you're an academic, you commit yourself to a life of service. Um, and so that's one of the observations. But I think he would also be very pleasantly surprised that I ended up at a faith-based institution, uh, John Carroll University, and he would say, well, it wasn't too far off. <laughs> um, so, you know, he's one of these people who, you know, I, I do look forward to meeting. My mom. So, it was October of 1978. I was a first year doctoral student at the University of Chicago. I got a call from my father that my mother had just had a heart attack and died. Um, and so, I had, you know, I got in the car, I had to wrap up some, some business. I just started, I was a month in. Um, I headed back to Madison, and I had excellent relationships with both my mom and dad. You know, so I had a sister who actually didn't have as great a relationship with her mom at the time, um, and she lived with it for many more years than I did. Uh, but I had a very good relationship. In fact, the, the month before my mom passed, we went to a Packer game in Milwaukee. My mother was a diehard Packer. Her brother-in-law, my Uncle Tiny, played for the Packers back in the 40s and 50s. Uncle Tiny was 375 pounds when he played. Uh, he was an offensive tackle for the Packers. Um, and so she was a diehard fan. But one of the most powerful lessons she gave me, which, again, you think about inflection points, and you think about, well, with respect to my grandfather, hopefully I've at least got some of the kindness, you know, that he had as a man that I always loved as a child. Uh, in my mom's ca uh, case, we grew up in a university town in Madison. It's a very diverse community. And I would always ask if you came across someone who was African-American or from 
India or from Asia, you know, from China or Japan. Uh, you would ask as a child, well, why is that person a different color? Why are they speaking differently? And my mother always had the exact same answer. She said, Michael, it would be a really boring world if we were all the same. Now, you can think of diversity of all kinds and say there's no more, you know, succinct statement of the importance of diversity than it would be a pretty boring world. So upon meeting my mom again, what would she tell me about my life? Well, again, I think she'd be happy with my professional accomplishments, but she died when I was 22. Um, so the one thing she was looking forward to in life was meeting our spouses and her grandchildren. She loved kids. I had a cousin named Ken, uh, who is a social worker now in Wisconsin. And uh, Kim was a year older than me. Well, cousin Kim was, uh, we lived two backyards away from each other. She could literally cut through two backyards and you were at Andy Mayer's house. Well, Kim was getting in trouble all the time because uh, he was always breaking things. His nick the nickname we gave him was Oops because he was always breaking stuff, um, and knocking things over and spilling cartons of milk and, and stuff like that. So he'd gotten in trouble and he used to come over and he'd sit in my mom's lap and my mom would hold him until he stopped crying, give him a cookie, my mom made great, great cookies, um, and then send him back home. Um, so again, while I hope that me and my wife and my kids don't actually meet her for a very long time, I think that upon you know, meeting her, what would she say? I think she would say that, those of you who met Mrs. Johnson, she would say, you married up. <laughs> and she would say, you know, the acorns don't fall too far from the tree. That the kids have turned out pretty decent. Uh, they're good boys. Um, so she would be very happy. Notion that my, my wife tells the boys this all the time. You know, there's nothing more important than family, and so this is something that that really came from my mom. Um, my dad. I've talked about my dad in some of my other lectures. Uh, one of which is posted actually on the president's web page about inspired leadership. Because he, to me, he was the, the ultimate inspired leader. Um, he was a very quiet, humble guy who was very accomplished. This is a guy who was the VIP surgeon oncological surgeon in the state of Wisconsin. He operated on governor's daughter, he operated on congresswomen. He was an expert in, in breast cancer uh, at a time. Imagine being a surgical oncologist in the 1960s and 70s. Everybody died. You were keeping people alive for months, hopefully years, and the amazing things that we're doing today. So uh, there was a ton of pressure on this guy. But he became a general practitioner first. I think one of the things about my dad is when he got his degree in chemistry from the University of Wisconsin, he actually had a chance to take part in a very famous study. He didn't know what it was. He would have been a junior chemist. But it was on the University of Chicago campus, and it was called the Manhattan Project. Mm -hmm. People know what that is? Mm -hmm. See, he would have been a lab assistant making heavy water for Dr. Fermi and the scientists. Uh, but instead, he chose, uh, he turned that offer down, and he chose to go he became a general practitioner where he was a small town doctor where he got to know all of his patients. And later when he became a surgical oncologist, he took that small town doctor approach with him. I had a good friend in my circle who was a male nurse on the same floor as my dad. Uh, we went to college together. And he said, your dad has the best bedside manner of any doctor in the whole hospital because it goes back to this as a, as a small town doctor. Um, there is one, so they used to say he's a doctor's doctor. Um, there is one incident in remember, yeah, I, could, I remember in particular, which is I had a good friend named Chris Cleppy who lived about five houses up on my block. And I must have been about eight or nine years old. And I saw Chris's mom and dad uh, out on the lawn on a Saturday afternoon talking and it was, I remember it being a very serious conversation. Mrs. Cleppy was crying. And Mr. Cleppy, uh, Floyd, was very serious as well. And uh, my dad later, years later, actually told me the story. I was remembered seeing this conversation went on for an hour. Well, Mrs. Cleppy had breast cancer. And the doctor at her hospital in town had given her three months to live. So they had this conversation 
you know, for an hour out on the lawn, and my dad said, come to my office first thing Monday morning. You know, and we're going to do something different. My dad kept her alive for six years. So if you go back to that point in time, that was a huge victory. You know, she got to see her, her and my, Chris's younger sister, Lisa, at least grow up and be able to remember um, her mom. You know, so my dad was just this incredible guy. But what was in, what, what, what I remember of him, he never told us what to do. We live in an age of, shall we say, helicopter parents and snowplow parents, and people, parents telling us that sometimes what to do. And my dad never told us what to do. He gave us opportunities. He opened, you know, he, he, he opened ours in the sense that he'd write the tuition check at least for us um, and show us, you know, options. Uh, but he would never tell us what to do. Instead, he, he led us by example. Uh, I, in another context, I told the story of when he came home and said, I just hired someone who's better than I to run the Wisconsin Clinical Cancer Center. And you don't hear that in many organizations. That someone took pride in the fact that he just went and hired someone who was better than he was. And his name was Paul Carbone. You know, my dad ran the, the cancer center for about 15 years and started it. Uh, Dr. Carbone came in and ran it for the next 20 years. Right. So I uh, came from Boston, Boston University. So he had a very distinct uh, leadership style, which was leading by example, which is again some of my inspiration for this as well, the leadership approach. Um, one of the things that, in my own college uh, career, never pushed me into a particular area. I didn't know what to do. I was a freshman. I said, well, I'll do all the pre-med stuff. I hated it. I didn't like chemistry. I didn't like, you know, biology. It was all this memorization and tables and, you know, cutting up little animals uh, that were already dead. Um, <laughs> and, and I didn't do well. And so I gravitated on my own to economics and psychology as majors. I became, I, I took an econ class that I loved, I took a psych class that I loved. I became a double major in economics and psychology. My grades increased on their own. No one had to tell me. I had to get my grades up. My grades went up because I found areas that I liked learning. Um, and uh, turns out those two areas talk about inflection points, those two areas are what led to me to get into the University of Chicago because there was this new area called decision sciences. And decision sciences was literally a combination of economics and psychology. So my double major put me in a position to get into a graduate school that I, I would have never thought as a freshman I would have gotten into um, and launched my academic career right after that. So upon meeting dad in heaven, what would he say? You know, I think, actually, I don't think for a while he would say anything. And my dad was one of these guys who we could sit together for hours and not necessarily have to talk. Right? There was just this comfort level with him that you didn't have to talk to make him happy. We would certainly talk quite a bit. Uh, and I've got that own relationship with my own boys. I can sit with one of my boys for an hour and do nothing. Right? And then maybe, maybe we'll start talking about something. But it's, it, they're infinitely comfortable just being near each other. And so he wouldn't say anything right away. I think eventually he would smile. And it would communicate that, you know, that well, I think I've done pretty well in my career. Um, but then he would remind me of something he told me in one of, us, one of our conversations. I used to catch a ride with him. He had the best parking spot on campus. Mm -hmm. The hospital was right in the middle of campus. So I used to sometimes hitch a ride with them and get dropped off right in the middle of campus. That was during the winter months when I couldn't ride my motorcycle. Um, <laughs> they learned something else about it. <laughs> uh, I had to give that up when I got married. <laughs> uh, he would have said, Michael, you're never too old to change professions. Whether you're 20, 30, 50, 60, it doesn't matter. If that ride to work in the morning isn't something you enjoy, it's time to change. And so this is something I thought about much later in life. I was a faculty member for 24 years at the University of Michigan. I thought I had the absolutely the best job in the world. I was a full professor. I was getting better than that. I don't have anybody telling me what to do. I teach my classes. I, you know, I do my research. Um, 
And why would I want to, one of my colleagues said, why would you want to become that four-letter word, the dean? Um, but this opportunity came, and you know, I was very happy doing what I was doing, but I didn't necessarily see myself doing it for the next 20 years. Right? And I thought of what my dad said, and it gave me the courage to, to try something different. So that's when I decided to become a dean at Cornell, which led to my becoming a provost at Babson, which led to my becoming the president of John Carroll. Um, so I think that he would, again, be happy that you know, I, things weren't going. I left because it's something I, I thought I wanted to do, not because I had to do it. I didn't become an administrator because I was failing at something else. I changed it because I wanted to do something different. I wanted to follow a different path. I wanted to be put in a position where I could rather just focus on my own teaching and research. I could make sure other people were successful um, in their teaching and research. So his, his impact on me was profound, uh, but in a quiet way, leading by example. Um, let me talk about the two professors now. Um, Hilly Einhorn was an amazing guy. He was brilliant. I was a, he was a Jewish man from, from Brooklyn. And I was a professor at the University of Chicago. He was on my dissertation committee. Uh, he was a gentleman, a scholar, and a doggone perfectionist. And you don't always want perfectionists on your dissertation committee. <laughs> right? The, um, he challenged me to do things I never thought I could do. So I remember I was almost done. I thought I was done. The other co-chair thought I was done with my dissertation. I would be able to wrap it up and publish, excuse me, and, and go through graduation in the spring. I have a meeting with Hilly and he says, you know, this, this, this theoretical model you have in, in decision sciences of how people make decisions in this way, I think you should develop a mathematical model of it. And that should be part of your dissertation. Put me behind six months. Right? I was not happy at the time. But it was great advice. So, you know, I, I spent another six months developing this. Um, the, the professors in the room are going to understand that, you know, your ability to have a single authored paper and one of the top journals in your field is incredibly important to your early career. Well, this model turned into one of those papers, a marketing science paper. You know, so the extra work could not have been more worth it. But it was like, I, mean, I don't develop mathematical models. Um, and I had to do this. Um, but it was good. So I'll never forget, <laughs> I'll never forget another day when he came in and he used uh, a simple decision science model, expected value, to explain why he was religious. So he said, you know, you can put probabilities on different things, states, you know, states, that's to say God exists, God doesn't exist. Because the God exists part has infinite value, if you put any weight on that part of the model, the value of the model is infinite. So he said, so that's why I'm, I'm an observant Jew. <laughs> Um, I never heard it put that way before. Um, upon meeting, I mentioned he had Hodgkin's disease. He passed off and passed away a few years after I left the university. But he was one of these just incredible guys. Um, upon meeting Hilly and Heavy, what would he say about my career? I think one of the first things he would say is how um, proud he was of sort of how it evolved. Because I moved from sort of experimentation-based decision science to quasi-experimental designs, field work, we developed large-scale survey work. Eventually, I took it into applied fields and a dozen different industries, you know, working as a consultant. Um, and I think what Hilly would say is, well, Michael, you turned out better than I thought. <laughs> and to tell you the truth, coming from Hilly Einhorn, that would be a compliment and a well um, He was just that kind of guy. So the last one is Professor Culbertson. Um, and I'm going to get to a Jesuit term, I think, that describes his inflection role on me uh, in a moment. But for professor Culbertson was my favorite economics professor at the University of Wisconsin. Um, one of the most unassuming, mild-mannered people you'd ever meet. Never sought the limelight, never sought fame or fortune. Um, but everyone remembered Professor Culbertson 
because, and we called him Professor Collison because I was an undergraduate, and that's what we called him. Whereas as a graduate student, we called Professor Einhorn Hill. Uh, but he'll always be known to me for Professor Collison. But when he passed away, he was literally one of the most beloved professors in the economics department in the history of the University of Wisconsin uh, because of his relationship with students. I took macroeconomics, money and banking, history of economic ideas. I sat in the front row. I loved his classes. I'd go to his office hours and ask him questions. I'll never forget this lecture he gave. It was near the end of the history of economic ideas. when he was talking about all these different economic models that we have, uh, from communism to libertarianism, right, with different capitalist models in between. And he's doing it all sort of in a linear, continuum way. And at the end of this lecture, he says, as he's explaining the extremes of communism and the extremes of sort of takes the line and wraps it into a circle and he knows, you know those are almost exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So it was one of those, you know, I think today you go mm -hmm. kind of moments, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but when I went to the University of Chicago, they didn't accept some of his classes because it was the wrong kind of economics. <laughs> it was too socialist. Right? It was the common school from um, the University of Wisconsin. Um, the, um, so he was an incredible guy. And upon meeting him in heaven, I think he would say, oh yeah, you're the young man from Madison West High School who always sat in the front row of my classes and came to ask questions in office hours. I don't think he would have, you know, known what kind of impact he had on me. Because he wouldn't necessarily have paid that much attention to it. But he took an enormous part in developing what you would call the joy of so our honors, pro our honors program uses this Jesuit term, gaudium de verite, joy from truth. Um, and so that is, I think, an inflection point, I think, that a lot of us reach uh, as students and as scholars, where it goes from being work to goes to being fun. And when it goes from being work to going to being fun, guess what? Your grades get better. You know, you just put the time and effort into it. Um, I think Professor Culbertson would have been very happy at John Carroll University teaching an environment like this because of the joy of truth. Uh, so the Jesuits remind us, if you think of all five of these individuals, the Jesuits remind us that no one who is remembered ever truly dies. Right? That that's what, you know, uh, life is all about. No one ever truly dies. Uh, so Grandpa, Mom, Dad, Hilly, Professor Culbertson, um, I hope we don't meet again for a long, long time. Um, but my memories of you are alive and well. You, know, you think of the inflection points they taught me. They taught me kindness. They taught me the importance of family. Uh, they taught me to lead by example, right? Not to lead by a position of authority. The meaning of excellence, or what or the quality of our responses, what the Jesuits call magis and enjoy it, right? So God bless you all, and thank you.